Show Up With Cameron Grant is a show done by someone else who's going through his own mental health journey, sharing the tips that have helped him along the way. Just note, he is not a licensed therapist. If you or a loved one are struggling, try reaching out to a friend or a family. And if that's not possible and you need help today, the other option you can do is you can call the crisis hotline at 651-266-7900. And there'll be someone there to help you with whatever you're going through. With that, let's begin the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of Show Up with Cameron Gran. Today, I thought I would continue what I did last week and let you guys get to know me a little bit more. And to do that, since I used music last time, I thought I would break down one of my favorite movies of all time, which is Stranger Than Fiction with Will Ferrell. It also has Dustin Hoffman, Emma Thompson, Queen Latifah, Maggie Gyllenhaal. And basically, the premise of this movie is there's a man named Harold Crick who lives a normal life until one day while he's brushing his teeth, he starts to hear this voice in his head. He doesn't think anything of it except why am I hearing this voice until the voice says what Harold Crick doesn't know is that he will die. So then he makes it his mission to try to figure out what this voice was saying to hopefully save his life. And the reason why I love this and the reason why I'm using this in this episode is because a lot of times it's hard for us to recognize what an intrusive thought is. A lot of people, especially in comedy, make it out to be, oh, just this random thought or like you're with your group of friends and you just hit them out of nowhere. That is a way of an intrusive thought if you just go with that impulse and hit somebody. But like, it's not great for recognizing them. Whereas, for instance, if you watch this film, Harold Crick goes about his life, he has his job, he has his uh, passions, his loves, and then he hears this voice and it doesn't sound like him. It sounds like Emma Thompson because she's the narrator. She's narrating every little thing he does and he's like, what is this voice? And then the reason why it's scary to him is because it isn't actually his own. It's just this outside voice that has nothing to do with what he actually wants in his life. And the reason why I love this film so much is because it's kind of like a book, a TV show, and movie all wrapped into one because you get all the best features of storytelling in this one comedy sweet little package. And what I realized is I don't want to just dive in head first into teaching you guys DBT skills because that can seem scary at first and I don't want to scare you guys away because sometimes the hardest step you can do in your own mental health journey is just admitting that you are struggling and you need help and all you can do for that help is just look for help on the internet or in this radio show or any way that you need to help start focusing on you and your own mental health. That's what I was hoping to provide for you guys is like if you're interested in learning mental health this film is kind of like a great foil for me to be like oh this is an example of this skill. This is an example of this skill. I will dive deeper into those skills in future episodes but I wanted to dive into like the broad spectrum of mental health in this because I'm like oh I can talk about my love of this film and my, why I love it so much as a storyteller and creator and I can also use it to communicate with you guys how much that I want people to realize it's okay for you to look at your own mental health without it being a negative. Because one of the biggest components in mental health is just recognizing that what you have control over and what you don't have control over. In order to accept the fact that you have to have good days with bad days, you have to understand that you don't always have control over what you do. And until you can accept that, it makes you feel powerless and then like you're on the verge of something terrible. Uh, I'm only a minute into the film and it starts off immediately with Emma Thompson talking. And what I love about it is so often we get lost in our own lives that we begin to think of them as unimportant. They're just average lives. Who cares? There's so much beauty in that averageness. The best thing that we can do in those moments is to just acknowledge the fact that we are all unique and we all have this perspective on the world. And the best thing that we can do is stay present in the moment and acknowledge the little gifts throughout the day, which is why one of the biggest tools in DBT is the five senses, the counting, like counting to five seconds for breathing, listing out what you see, touching something. Those are all different skills. And it's amazing to me how cathartic and nice it can feel. Just to rub your hands down your leg, because then what it does is your brain can sometimes make you feel disconnected to your body. But if you can find a way to come back into your body and let the anxiety slip away enough and the depression be like, I understand that you want me right now, but I just need this, these moments in my own skin to process what's happening. And then I will face you another day. Okay, we are now three minutes and 43 seconds in. It's the end of 
our introduction to Harold Crick. What I love about it is it's kind of, without telling you directly, is showing you Harold's OCD behavior. You get how much he uses numbers and facts in his life simply by, as he's going through the, the scene of this movie, we're seeing all these numbers and like screens and like the amount of things that he has pop up next to him or the amount of seconds or amount of steps that he has to take per block to get to the bus on time. Those are very obsessive things to know in your own head. But what I love about it is it's kind of, oh, he just knows all this facts it's not a big deal. It's nothing unordinary about it. It's just how he goes about his life and he thinks it's all normal because it is normal for him and he doesn't judge himself for that. And the last thing I'll say because it's talking about Harold's wristwatch, everything up till now is extreme narrator. If you read a book, it's like this. Harold's wristwatch is a normal wristwatch, but we get the fact that it likes to feel the air against his face. We get the fact that even though Harold likes tying his tie a certain way because it saves him some time, the wristwatch thinks that this other way of tying his tie is more important. That's something that I love is like making something as ordinary as wristwatch I have thoughts about what's going on around him. And I really like that, that examination in this film. He began it the same way he always did. When others' minds would- Hello, is someone there? <laughs> We're five minutes in. This is the, and he began it the same way he always did. It's the first time that Harold hears this thought in his head. A lot of times we're going about our normal everyday lives and out of nowhere we have this thought. Some of us hear our, ourselves as those intrusive thoughts. Some people like me hear kind of a shadow of like actual words that were said to me growing up by people. What happens is I'm hearing them and seeing them say these things to me over and over in my mind. And because of that, I'm like, it must be true because these people are saying it to me. And that was what I was starting to notice is because I'm hearing these other voices that are real events that, that had took place, real things that were said to me and taking them as fact, because obviously if these people think I'm worth nothing, then it must be true, especially when it didn't seem like anybody I was surrounding myself with told me differently. They're like, yeah, that's true. Uh, why think differently? And that's kind of like what an interest of thought can feel like sometime, because again, the basic example is if you, so you so your friend walking in front of you and you just slap them for no reason and then you're like why did I why did you just hit me it's like I have no clue I just had that impulse that's an impulse intrusive thought which can happen but it, intrusive thoughts are kind of like negative like especially with my depression and I've had suicidal ideation for a long period of my life and a lot of things set me off because I was hearing other people that was the best thing I could do and all you have to do is recognize the power you have within yourself but this scene does an amazing job of just showcasing how it can begin for some people because sometimes you can't stop intrusive thoughts from happening until you hear them actually start and for Harold in the first few minutes of this film we saw him get narrated by Emma Thompson and he was completely unaware but then all of a sudden it clicked in his brain and now he's hearing her and he's like what is this voice what am what am I thinking because it doesn't sound like me especially because at the end of the scene it says this Wednesday isn't like any Wednesday because what he doesn't know is at the end of this week he's going to die and he's like excuse me a thought that I can't understand. Why are you telling me that? Because it's one thing you should do with intrusive thoughts is you should challenge them and question them. I'm sorry, did you hear that? At 6.12, Harold at the bus, and she says, Harold just thought it was a Wednesday. And then as Harold runs to meet the bus, he misses it. And then there's a woman there who's also waiting for the bus. And this is an example of checking the facts. You hear something in your head and you start to freak out. And then instead of freaking out, you're like, wait, give me a second. Let me ask somebody else in the room. And if somebody else in the room is viewing this the same way that I am, then maybe I can dive deeper into this anxiety or this feeling I'm having. One, I've checked in on somebody else to make sure it's actually happening. It's not something that's triggered by previous trauma in my life. This is actually really what's happening so then I can face it head on and that's what I love is like it's kind of Harold just thought it was a Wednesday and then he's like are you hearing this voice in my head because it, it sounds really bizarre but he's like maybe everybody else is now hearing this voice we are now 12 minutes and 52 seconds in. This is the scene at the baker where he's meeting Maggie Gyllenhaal's character for the first time. And the reason why I love the scene so much is it's kind of like he's going between what he wants to be doing logically, which is being a professional tax person there for an audit and like these thoughts going on inside of his head. And you'll notice what happens is he allows Emma Thompson's narration to play out through his mind before he goes back to actually being present and allowing himself to be in the moment. And I feel 
this is a great example of mindfulness is because sometimes we have thoughts that feel very powerful and we don't know how to experience life without giving in to them and so we judge ourselves for them and usually when we start judging ourselves what would have taken 15 seconds of your time turns into like 5-10 minutes if not longer depending on where you are in your mental health that day. Mindfulness is all about staying present in the moment and allowing yourself to have those small moments to be just you and to be there with somebody else in a room and actually engage with them. You can't allow thoughts in your mind to distract you because then what you're doing is you're living in this thought world, not your present stay in this actual world. You have to ha have thoughts but bring yourself back to present so you can actually engage and enjoy moments with people because sometimes we miss happy times or miss even sad times with people because we're so distracted by what's happening in our head. Whereas, especially if you're down, if you can be down with somebody and they can just listen to you and it's like a shared experience and you're like, okay, we're giving each other this 30 minutes to do on something that's sad in our life and then we're gonna move on and that's okay. That's kind of like an introduction to mindfulness. It's just imagining a beach and thoughts to come in and out of your life and you have them for a period and then you're gonna say, I allowed you to have like the last five minutes. It's time for you to recede back into the ocean so I can go back to being present and living my life for that day. It's a scene right after Queen Latifah shows up to help Emma Thompson figure out how to kill the main protagonist of her story, which just so happens to be Harold Crick, because right as of this moment, the author does not realize she's actually narrating somebody's real life. A lot of us, when we're going through things, contemplate different realities in our brain, especially because as an author, she is planning to kill her character at the end of the book and is trying to figure out the best way to get there. And the reason why I stopped to highlight this moment is because for me, whenever my brain went to these places, there was a lot of shame involved. And shame is something that is not justified. We shame ourselves for intrusive thoughts sometimes because we can't understand why our brain would even think something. But the whole point of an intrusive thought is it comes out of nowhere and it takes a long time to recognize the fact that our thoughts are not us. They are a manifestation of what's going on in your life that day, like the news, anything that you're exposed to. You can't control what happens in your brain. All you can do is what you choose to do with your life and your body. I used to have a lot of shame whenever I contemplated suicide because I'd be like, you shouldn't be thinking about this. Why are you doing this? If you're trying to not feel bad or feel down or feel terrible, the worst thing you can do is shame yourself. Because if you're thinking about that, you're already in a negative place. And when you shame yourself, you're not going to be able to come up for air. You're going to push yourself further into that hole. So the best thing you can do in those moments is to pause and breathe. Last episode, I talked about the 8888 method, which is what I like, which is like when you breathe in for eight seconds, you hold for eight seconds, then you breathe out for eight seconds, and then you wait eight seconds before breathing in again. And what that does is it kind of pushes you to reconnect with your body, as well as what I said with your hands can do that, or even looking around and just being like, oh, there's a screwdriver in my room right now. What does a screwdriver look like? It Mine is black with a blue end, and it's silver on the top with a magnetic tip. And so now I'm picturing in my head. So now my brain, if I was thinking about the, uh, and having dark thoughts, is thinking like 30% less about those dark thoughts because now it's preoccupied listing. And it's kind of like, oh, you're refocusing your energy of your thoughts. One of the biggest things I learned at DBT is the difference between shame versus guilt. Guilt can be justified. Shame cannot. And I'll dive deeper into that, but I, because I think I dived into that last time. It's one of the biggest lessons that helped me. So if you're like, why is he always talk about this? It's probably because it helped me the most. At 2044, Harold and his wristwatch is going crazy because Harold is refusing to listen to him. He's trying to tell him that the girl he likes is passing by. And because he's a watch, he, Harold never listens to him. I love this kind of narration. It's my favorite thing in books with something as simple and inanimate as a watch can have all these pent up emotions. It's kind of like the function of how Tinkerbell is a fairy who can only express one emotion at a time, but she doesn't talk. It's mostly like her attitude, the way that she communicates with people around her. It's the same thing with this rich watcher. Little did he know that this simple, seemingly innocuous act would result in his imminent death. What? What? Hey, hello? 2127, the part that I was telling you guys about, Thompson's character finally said, by resetting his watch, what he didn't know is it would result in his imminent death. 
At that second, he started screaming at the narrator, trying to get answers, because if this is going to lead to him dying, he needs to know why. And I wish sometimes that we were adamant about learning like the reasons behind the way we're feeling, as his wristwatch was so interested in trying to help him change the course of his life. Because basically, at the end of the day, in order to allow things that trigger us to become less and less powerful over us, we have to stop, address them, know why we're triggered, so that way every time we get triggered again we can figure out how to get out of our peak depression or anxiety faster because if you're up at the peak you're not going to get uh, released until you are below a certain threshold sometimes you just have to learn different coping mechanisms and that's okay the goal is by addressing what triggers us what makes us feel a certain way the more and more we think about them the more and more we understand them then the more and more we'll be able to address them as they come let them leave sooner than they would have if we just kept ignoring them and never addressed what brought them here to begin with. 25 minutes. And then the last scene we saw Harold with a therapist trying to get help for something very specific to him. The biggest thing you need to learn for anybody struggling with mental health, advocate for yourself. If what you're being told by a therapist and what they're telling you to respond with doesn't feel like it's actually what you're dealing with, then maybe it's time to see a different therapist, maybe explain to them that you don't want to use the kind of medication they're prescribing, or maybe if, for me, for instance, I realize that I am a more active like participant in my own mental health. I want tools that I can use. I don't want to sit with it. I want to understand where it's coming from so I can address it and I can move past it. Only you know where your limit lies. Only you know how to handle your mental health. All I'm doing with this show is highlighting different tools that you can use, but only you can try those tools and figure out what works best for you. And that's kind of what Harold was saying is because a lot of what he was describing at the time of this film, 2006, relates to schizophrenia. But what he was saying is I understand that that that's what you're, would be normally happening, but I don't feel like that's my scenario. And for you, make sure if you're hearing this and somebody's telling you that, that if you're like, I don't know if I have schizophrenia, I know that that can be a stigmatized thing and people can be afraid to be diagnosed with that. Instead of judging yourself, just pause for a minute and be like, can you break that down for me more? Can you push past what people tell me in passing so I can understand it more and I can approach what you're saying without judgment rather than fear. And then if I'm going to treat it, if I need to be on medication, what other tools can I use to help me still feel like me on my medication? This is just an example, but like, it's kind of like, okay, you want me to do these things for you. I need these things for me in order to be happy with myself and my mental health as well. All in all, it's important to advocate for yourself because some people, even though they're therapists, they think they know all the answers, regardless of what you're trying to convey to them. And I've had had it happen where I wasn't listened to and that put me in a bad spot. So make sure regardless that you feel validated, heard, and then addressed what you were expressing. But being validated and heard for your experience is important with every interaction. 35 minutes into the film, we just had the scene with Dustin Hoffman and Will Ferrell where they're going over all the different stories that Harold could possibly be in and checking them off on a list of possible authors and the style of which they write. And what I like about this is a lot of times we feel isolated when when I say check the facts, and I said earlier you can check somebody else, but really you're just that was just a, an example of checking something as simple as I heard something that sounded like a gunshot. Is it really a gunshot or was it a car backfiring? Because that happens. So in those scenarios, you're talking to somebody else, but you're not in it with somebody else. And that's kind of what a therapist can do for you, or even a friend or family member you trust to help you navigate your mental health without judgment. Because you can't gain control over your mental health if you feel judged because you have to be able to accept all parts of yourself in order to heal. Open up to somebody who you know is okay with hearing everything about you so you can heal fully rather than only heal the parts you're willing to share. And that's something I like with Dustin Hoffman in this movie is he's kind of asking all these questions about literature, trying to figure out who's narrating this book. But even though he has his skepticisms about whether or not it's really a book, because he has like a scientific mind, he's like, okay, if I'm going with this, this is how I would address this. I'm going for the answer without putting judgment on Harold himself. Helping him, even though in his own mind, he doesn't put much stock into the reality of him actually being narrated. And that's something that's important is you have to have somebody in your corner who's just there with you. They're not trying to get anything from you. This may sound like gibberish to you, but uh, I think I'm in a tragedy. Sometimes we have 
thoughts in our head that are not true. But when we're in pain and we're struggling, we look to find ways to prove them as true. They're irrational thoughts. They're things that are clearly not what it is. But because of the fact that he just had the girl that he's had a crush on do something so nice for him, instead of allowing that to be, he messed up by basically by throwing her cookies in his face. And if you have an irrational thought in your head, the best thing you can do is to poke holes at it, especially because he was trying to figure out, or obviously in this scenario, whether or not the, the book he is in is narrated in a tragedy or a, a comedy genre. So for that, I'll excuse it a little bit, but is it a reflection of how we can do that to ourselves sometimes? We'll have a terrible thought, and instead of catching it and saying it's not true, we will reflect on every single scenario that could actually prove this thought. Like, for instance, this is a shame statement. If you were to think, I'm a terrible person, you thought about all those times where that could possibly be true, you'd be setting yourself up for pain and ways to just make yourself feel down. Because instead of asking people around you, checking in on the facts, you're just going and finding all the things that have happened in your life to prove that to yourself when you have to catch those and actually challenge them. And that is something that you can do in real life is instead of catching a negative thought, you let it go for too long uh, because you just accept it as truth when it is not true. 52 minutes into the film, and in this scene, Harold is trying not to encourage the narrator to speak at all. So he was staying home, he wasn't doing anything. What he was doing is called avoidance. Instead of facing what's going on with us, we avoid it completely. And in this scenario, which is an extreme scenario, if they wanted to know whether or not he was leading the narration or the narration was leading him. He was ignoring it, and there were calls and letters going to him. Literally, a truck goes to the side of his house. And for this scenario, what you have to remember is sometimes the longer we avoid an emotion, the stronger and stronger it is until it can have so much power that when we face it, it feels like it's knocking us over. It's literally blowing out the side of a house to come at us completely with so much force we don't know how to deal with it. And that's kind of what's going on in this scenario. He was avoiding rather than making a deal or like acknowledging and being like, okay, I need them some time for me for the next two hours. I am not going to avoid you forever. I'm just telling you that I have to wait to actually address this and I'll address it then. Um, and that's usually the best way to help you in your mental health is instead of avoiding and not acknowledging the emotions behind something, especially when something really hard happens and we're upset. A lot of times we feel like we don't want to be depressed anymore and so we avoid. But when we avoid, it can lead us into bad scenarios. And I'm encouraging not to do that. Try your best not to avoid life when it gets hard. We are about halfway through the movie and we just got over the scene where he was asking his friend if he knew he was going to die? What would he do with his uh, remaining time? Obviously his friend was like, what is this? And hypothetical, what is my life? Am I the richest man alive? Am I a king? And then Harold's like, no, you're just you and you know you're going to die. And what I like about this is not the fact that obviously he knows he's going to die, but it's more of like a lot of times we get caught up comparing our own lives to other people and we forget to just live our life for ourselves. And sometimes when we have a time limit and we know there's a, only so much time left, what it does for us us is it gives us an opportunity to choose to live in the moment and embrace us for who we are. We just got to the part where he got a guitar, he's learning to play it, he's putting himself out there, getting new friends, finally going to ask Anna Pascal, Mickey Gyllenhaal out. And what I like about this is when you can learn to be present, when you can be mindful, you can find happiness every second of your life because you're allowing yourself to register the difference between when you are at your peace mode when you're just navigating life and how it is and when you're going up and down whether that's happiness or sadness you'll know when you're returning to what I call I want to say a plateau because a plateau makes it sound boring but it's kind of like it's you know when you return peace and that's kind of what he's doing is he's like finally allowing himself to live this moment but in that same scene with the guitar playing and all the uh, and all these other things that he's learning to do if you're ever at the point where you're not able to do anything to prevent yourself from what's happening to you mentally the best thing you can do is act opposite. If you're avoiding doing the dishes, do them. That seems like an understatement. If you can't do them, you can always do like, I'll do my dishes slowly. I'll do like them for a minute. Whatever I get done in that minute is fine. And then I'll move on to something else. It's the same thing with like, oh, I'm really depressed and I want to live in that. Or I have this passion for the guitar. I can pick it up and like live a couple of hours in my passion rather than my depression. It's kind of like you're acting opposite by finding what brings you happiness in the moment. And sometimes when you are depressed, you're not
not going to instantly feel happy. Usually it's gradually you'll return to normal. It's not like an instantaneous fix. You'll slowly get there. But knowing the things that you have in your life that bring you happiness when you are at a place where you're extremely depressed or have a lot of anxiety, you can do these things to slowly bring yourself back down to your normal self. And that's kind of what he's doing. He's like, I now know that I have this time limit. I now know that I'm going to die soon. And instead of causing myself a lot more anxiety or being depressed about all this time I've lost, I'm allowing myself to live every second to the fullest because every second matters, which every second of your life matters no matter what. It's just sometimes we don't acknowledge and register that. We are an hour and 12 minutes in. Harold has just discovered who is the person narrating his book. Um, and what I like about it is there's a power in facing what's happened to you head on. He could have retreated. He could have tried to avoid it. Instead, he found out her name and now he's going to actively try to go and find her and speak to her and obviously try to change her mind where obviously this is a movie in your own head. What I would say is when you have thoughts that scare you, stop and confront them for a second and then ask, why am I having this thought? And if you can't answer that question, try to figure out if something changed in your body when the thought happened. For me, I noticed that my body sometimes reacts differently to how my mind feels like it should. Because when you experience trauma, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen to your brain, it also happens to your body. And so a lot of times we can heal through our minds because we can address thoughts that have to do around our trauma. But sometimes until our bodies feel safe again, we sometimes can still get triggered by things, especially if they remind us of those previous traumatic experiences. For me, if I started to feel myself being triggered, I try to ask why and then try to confront it head on and then be like, I understand that this sensation used to make you feel this way and so that's why you're spiraling. But that's not what's happening now. It's completely different and you are okay and you are safe. And then above all else, I usually always try to tell myself that you are loved. Okay, everyone, we are an hour and 20 minutes in. This is the scene where Harold finally confronts the author, Emma Thompson. Something that I will say for me is I learned through therapy that I have a thing called anticipation anxiety, which means my anxiety is the worst the longer I have to think about something. Given time, I will make myself so anxious by thinking about all of the what-if scenarios that it scares me to not being able to move or be have action. So I learned through therapy that the best thing I can do for myself is to stop questioning whether or not to go and do something. Stop thinking about those what ifs and just go for it. Go for the thing that scares you because I'm telling you, no matter what it is that scares you, nothing that actually happens is going to be as scary as what you are putting in your head. Which is why in this next scene, when he talks to the author, you can see him sweating because he's dreading what this is going to be like because he's worried about his death. But by confronting it and actually having the real conversation, it can no longer be this thing that he's built up in his head. It's just the reality of what it is. And that reality is a lot better than anything he could have put in his own head. 30 minutes left. Um, and Harold has just given the book of his life over to the professor that's been helping him analyze whether or not the best thing to do is to let the, what the story says happen or to hopefully change something so he can continue to live. And what I love about the fact that he gives it over to the professor is the fact that he knows he's not a professor. He, he knows he doesn't know that much about English or how a story functions or how that works. Works. And so what he's doing is he's saying, I trust you to help guide me with what happens next. And there's a beauty in rationally accepting something where you're like, I don't know what's going to go happen from here, but I know I can trust him to help guide me to where my life ends up. And sometimes some you have to accept the fact that you may die. And a lot of times you're angry or you can get anxious or depressed about that happening. But when you accept that you will, it can be very freeing. An example of rational acceptance is here in the Twin Cities, there's a hill that leads right off to the airport. And when you drive up the hill, airplanes come down. I was driving up this hill as a giant airplane came down it. And in that moment, I was like, okay, I'm not angry. I'm not sad. I'm just gonna embrace these last three seconds because when it crashes, it's going to cover the entire freeway I am on. So I'm just going to accept my fate and enjoy these last few seconds. Luckily, it was an optical illusion. It did not happen. But that's an extreme scenario of rational acceptance. And it's just kind of like you have to accept the fact that there are things within your control and there are things outside of it. And when you can learn to tell the difference, I feel like there's 
there's so much power in that because then you can actually choose things that will help you in the long run rather than distract yourself with things that you will never be able to change. An hour and 28, Harold just heard Dustin Hoffman explain to him that the best thing he could do is to live through what she has tentatively written for her book and explain to him that by accepting this fate, he could die and it would be so poetic and it would mean so much. Or they could ask her to change it and he could survive, but at the end of the day, everyone lives only so long and everyone has to face death. So really it's a choice between a known death or the unknown of this other outcome that could eventually happen. And what I love about the way he's talking, Dustin Hoffman, is it's very clear that he doesn't want to be saying these things to Harold, but he's such a literary professional that he can see that what she wrote out and the payoff is so beautifully poetic that to see it come across would mean so much. As a writer and a storyteller, I understand this. But in this scenario, it's a real person and if he lives through this you were writing a book knowing that the person's fate is actually tied into how you end it is it's kind of like how do you want to spend your last days do you want to be sad about the fact that you were going to die or do you want to spend it choosing to be happy in spite of that this is now going to be when I share one of my favorite quotes by somebody who's no longer with us and her name is Nightbird the thing that she said that stuck with me is the fact that she is somebody who has had a terrible life. She has been struggling with cancer for so long and recently she did pass away from cancer but something that she said which I feel like is so impactful is the fact that you can't wait for the terrible times to be over to choose to be happy because you have no control of when they will be over. All you can control is how you view this moment and every moment after and that beauty is kind of what that scene reminded me of is we can ask Emma Thompson's character to change the ending but who knows if the way you will go will be as beautiful or, or as meaningful to the world as this book will be. And either way, I think is a good decision, but it's up to him because it's his life. But I think that the important thing is choosing to be happy in every moment and choosing to be open to happiness despite knowing what's coming is important. Because when you close yourself down, you make it so it's harder to be open to the good times. Because the good times can be so simple and quick. And if you don't open your eyes to be there for them, you'll miss them. No, I, I, I read it and and I, I loved it. And there's only one way it can end. I love your book. And I think you should finish it. If you're watching this video, you're seeing me tear up because, again, I've said it a couple times in this video, it's rational acceptance. It's easier to be afraid than it is to accept something. And I feel like there's power in knowing and accepting that we only have so much time and choosing how we go is something that we all hope for. We want our lives to have meaning and when we leave, we want to make sure that we leave how we want it to. We don't know how we're going to die and to be given the opportunity of knowing and finding Ending, the beauty of it. I don't know, it's so emotional to me, which is why maybe I love this movie so much just because I feel like it makes it so you don't have to be afraid about the unknown anymore. And I feel like that's probably people's biggest fear when it comes to like death and like life and humanity is just we don't know until it happens. So we fear it. When we accept it, it has less power over us. And that's kind of the same thing with me is I've had a lot of stark suicidal thoughts. And when I finally accepted the fact that my brain for some reason just like sending those thoughts to me instead of judging it I'm like I understand what you're trying to send to me but this is not my decision these are not my thoughts so my answer is no thank you <laughs> but I'm not going to judge you for thinking those things I'm going to say what wasn't I giving myself why didn't I give myself permission to feel loved and what's missing in my life that's allowing me to feel that way because I don't need to feel that way why because you are loved, sometimes people don't show up for you the way you show up for them, which is why the ending quote of this show is show up for yourself. Because until you can do that, you can't really show up for somebody else because you don't know how to do that and securely look after yourself knowing that you're good while you're helping them. Let's continue. We're nearing the end. I bet you all thought that this was going to be a sad ending. In fact, was not. 
And the reason why I showed this to you is because this film like, encompasses everything that I love about storytelling. It takes you on this journey. It makes you think about the way you look at the world. It makes you wonder about like, could I accept that? Or do I also not have power over my own life? And that's kind of the story so much because it's kind of about accepting you the way you are instead of accepting you the way you want to be. Because if you want to be a certain way, you can get there. But something that I learned, especially because I am big and I want to be healthier, is I'm doing things to get to where I want to be. But I refuse to accept the fact that I have to put myself down and shame me now to get to a me that's more appropriate for other people later. I want to love myself every day until, no, no until. I want to love myself every day, no matter what. And if I get to those places that I want to be, great, amazing. But it's also okay to live here and now and accept it for what it is. Because today matters. You matter. Matter, and it's important that you show up for yourself. So I hope you guys enjoyed my breakdown of Stranger Than Fiction with Will Ferrell. To let you guys know that next week I'll be watching The Seventh Seal. It will going over mindfulness. So if you guys want to watch that or you can listen along and I'll give timestamps and it'll be the first lesson going over DBT, which will be mindfulness. And again, these are just tools if you need them and you want to try them out for yourself, you can because all I'm here for is to just be a friend or you can let it go. But whatever else, just remember that you matter and to show up for yourself. Show up with Cameron Grant runs every Monday on 94.1 WFNU Frogtown Radio with music. If you want to listen to his podcast or see the video version of this episode, you can follow at Gran underscore central underscore on all social media, where he posts episodes every Wednesday at 5 p.m. without music. Thank you. And as always, as you go throughout the week, don't forget to show up for yourself because you matter.